Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to today's live stream reflection from St. Peter Mancroft Church, which is entitled Poetry on the Edge of Faith. Now, poetry has always been a fabulous way to express human faith in God, right from the Psalms in the Old Testament up to the hymns, which are sung every single Sunday in this church. Poetry has spoken eloquently of faith. But poems are also a fantastic way to speak of something else, of doubts and questions about the divine. For me, actually, poetry is simply the best art form for doing this. And so I'm hoping to offer a little series of reflections which I'm calling Poetry on the Edge of Faith, each of which will look in some detail at a poem which feels kind of agnostic in some way or another. And we're going to start today with a poem by Thomas Hardy which may surprise some of you, as Hardy has always been much better known as a novelist, of course. But after the terrible reception of his final novel, Jude the Obscure, I don't know if you've read it, an Anglican bishop actually is reputed to have burnt the book in protest at its anti-Christian tone. And after that, Hardy turned largely to writing poetry instead. And the volume I have at home of his poems includes a whole section entitled Belief and Unbelief, some 30 poems in all. Titles include God's Funeral, The Graveyard of Dead Creeds, A Drizzling Easter Morning. You get the kind of picture. And it includes the poem we're going to look at today, God Forgotten. And if you're watching online, you can find the poem if you click Show More on the YouTube page and then click the link. Now, before I start, I have one more point to make about Hardy's poetry in general, which is that it really isn't cutting edge in terms of style. For many decades now, it's been rather unfashionable, actually. And when you hear today's poem, you'll probably agree that it sounds as though it was written not at the start of the 20th century, but perhaps a hundred years earlier than that. But I think the strength of Hardy's poems lies elsewhere. They're often really quite dramatic, little narratives in themselves, and they often encapsulate real thought, subtle ideas, but in a way which really brings these ideas alive. God Forgotten, today's poem, looks at an area of theology known as theodicy. What's that? Well, we all know that when we look around, we see a world just full of suffering and darkness and sin. And theodicy asks a profound question. How on earth? earth can we believe in God in such a difficult and often terrible world? If God knows about this suffering and is powerful, God must be at least careless and at worst evil because he doesn't appear to be doing anything about it. But if God is actually good and loves us, we have to conclude that God is powerless because he doesn't appear to be doing anything about all this pain. He can't. God Forgotten, today's poem, steps boldly into this theological minefield. And it's a little story in which the poet imagines travelling to the courts of heaven, the courts of God, with a kind of petition from humanity. Where are you? Help us. And he ends up in conversation, a very revealing conversation, with God. So here it is, the poem, God Forgotten. I towered forth, and lo, I stood within the presence of the Lord Most High, sent there by the sons of earth, to win some answer to their cry. 
the earth, says'st thou, the human race, by me created, sad its lot? Nay, I have no remembrance of such place, such world I fashioned not. O Lord, forgive me when I say, thou spakest the word and madest it all. Hmm. The earth of men, let me bethink me. Yea, I do dimly recall some tiny sphere I built long back, mid millions of such shapes of mine, so named. It perished, surely, not a rack remaining or a sign. It lost my interest from the first, my aims therefore succeeding ill. Haply it died of doing as it durst. Lord, it existeth still. Ah, dark then its life, for not a cry of aught it bears do I now hear. Of its own act the threads were snapped, whereby its plaints had reached mine ear. It used to ask for gifts of good, till came its severance, self-entailed, when sudden silence on that side ensued, and has, till now, prevailed. All other orbs have kept in touch, their voicings reach me speedily. Thy people took upon them over much in sundering them from me. And it is strange, though sad enough, Earth's race should think that one whose call frames daily shining spheres of flawless stuff must heed their tainted ball. But sayest thou tis by pangs distraught and strife and silent suffering? Deep grieved am I that injury should be wrought on even so poor a thing. Thou shouldst have learnt that not to mend, for me could mean but not to know. Hence, messengers, and straightway put an end to what men undergo. Homing at dawn, I thought to see one of the messengers standing by. Oh, childish thought, yet oft it comes to me when trouble hovers nigh. My goodness, what a vision of God this poem gives, at times almost comic, if only the subject matter weren't so very serious. I'll pull out a few strands from Hardy's complex portrayal of God. Most importantly, God is shown as not omniscient, not knowing about everything. In fact, he comes across as confused, forgetful, senile, one might almost say. The earth? Nay, I have no remembrance of such place. And God needs a really good prodding from his visitor actually to start remembering this little planet of ours which he built so long ago, just one of many millions of such places. But later in the poem, God offers another reason for his lack of knowledge, which is that he no longer hears from planet Earth. Humanity used to bend God's ear like the inhabitants of other planets, but some time back they stopped talking. The channel of communication was cut by humanity itself. But once this unknowing God is alerted to the sufferings of planet Earth, he does show himself to be caring. I'm grieved that Earth is suffering, God says. And when I know about a problem, I always work to mend it. With God, not to mend means not to know. And next, we see that God in this poem, the God of this poem, does have at least some power. He immediately moves into action, sending messengers to earth to heal all the darkness and the suffering. And the poet also goes home, back to earth, and he thinks, or he hopes, 
actually to see one of the messengers standing ready. But then comes the killer line. Oh, childish thought. Yet often it comes to me when trouble hovers nigh. This, I think, pierces to the very heart of what many of us feel about God. That to believe in a God who does help us, perhaps with angels or even a saviour, is a bit of a childish delusion. The God delusion, in a famous phrase. But this caring God is nonetheless something people long for in a desperate situation when there seems no other way out. My own dad, um, an agnostic through and through, often described how during the Second World War he was in a life-threatening situation and he found himself praying to a God that he never before and actually seldom afterwards believed in or spoke to. Well, that's quite a poem to hear in a Christian church, isn't it? And I suppose the standard thing for me to do at this point would be to offer the Christian response to this poem, answering its questions, solving the problems from a Christian perspective. I'm not going to do that. And for reasons which feel very important to me. First, I want to give the pain and the doubt and the real sincerity of Hardy's poem a platform, some space in which it can have a proper and respectful hearing. And I think a church is the perfect place for that. Second, any answer which Christianity might in all humility be able to offer to Hardy is not simple to be encapsulated in a few sentences at the end of a brief reflection. No, to pay proper respect to both Hardy's poem and to the Christian faith, I have to leave the questions hanging, trusting that they may provoke something or other in you, the audience. That, after all, is what poetry is best at. Thank you for listening and watching.